Well, good evening and welcome back everyone. Uh, my name is Dawn Danko. I am chair of the school board and the Ward 7 trustee at HWDSB. And tonight uh, we're offering this Facebook Live just to go over some key information for back to school as we want to give you the chance to create as smooth a transition for your children to get back to HWDSB schools as possible. I am really excited to be welcoming students and staff back in person um, really, I know that students, and I've heard from many families, they're looking forward to what is hopefully a normal school year. Um, but there are a number of things that I'm sure you have questions about. Uh, I do want to acknowledge some people that are here to support me tonight. So I am joined by our communications team and want to say a big thank you for helping set all of this up. It wouldn't look this nice uh, or this fancy if I was doing this at home. Uh, we have our Vice Chair, Trustee Becky Buck, who's joining us as well, uh, Associate Director Sue Dunlop, our Facilities Manager, David Anderson, and I'm really excited to be able to introduce our new Director of Education, Cheryl Robinson Petrazzini. I want to thank all of our staff, actually, who are preparing to welcome your children back into our schools for next week. But a particular thank you to the staff who've been working throughout the summer. We've had many people working on our facilities to make sure that they are improved, they're modern, they're ready to receive our students. Uh, we've had our IT staff working behind the scenes on everything digital, and I am sure if you've had issues with iPads or you've had to exchange devices, um, they've been supporting that. Our human resources team continues to work on many different fronts, including preparing for bargaining with our union groups, but they're also working on hiring. I know that we struggled last year with all boards struggled with shortages in, in our education pools and in our different educator groups. And so we really thank them for their work. Um, of course, we've had people at the Education Center here ready to support families who had questions and needs over the summer. So again, a big thank you to all of our staff, but those who worked this summer, a big thank you for that as well. So over the past few years, um, we have shared a number of important updates, tried to clarify information through a format such as this. I want to just acknowledge that our communications team has been working around the clock and with our executive council and our staff to make sure that there's a lot of important and useful information available to you. I'm going to go over where to find that information and make sure that you've subscribed to the school website so you get school updates and also consider subscribing to the board website. Um, I also just want to make sure that you understand we want to answer questions tonight, but the focus is on the return to school, so back to school questions. If there's something that we're not able to answer and the team's going to sort of collect themes of questions and share those with me, um, if, you, if we don't answer your question, please reach out through communications at hwdsb.on.ca and we'll make sure that we, we get you a response. Um, I want to make sure that you, you know how to access all of the information that is available and your questions are going to help inform any additional communications that we share out over the next week. So uh, jumping in, I just want to acknowledge that as a parent, I know that this week can be exciting, but there can be some trepidation as you look to a new school year. I've heard from many of our students, as I mentioned, that excitement around getting back to maybe a normal school year with extracurricular activities, with sports, seeing friends. Um, I know my kids are more excited than they've been pretty much any year, which is surprising. Um, as you're preparing and looking for information about classroom teachers, bell times, bus information, safety measures, that's what we'll talk about tonight. Um, but again, if you have outstanding questions, you can always reach out to your school. The school offices are open this week. We have our school administrators supporting you. Um, so please reach out, but be mindful it is a busy time and they will get back to you as soon as possible if, if they're not available immediately. Um, so today I'm going to review where to find information for back to school. Um, I'm going to invite our new Director of Education to come and talk a little bit about our plans for focusing on learning recovery and supporting our students uh, this school year. Uh, Trustee Buck is going to come and share a little, a number of tips and some information about preparing for a positive return to school. Uh, I do want to touch on health and safety measures for school, including what to do if your child has symptoms, um, when you need to isolate, and I will acknowledge that there is just an update and changes to that today. So we'll, we'll review some of those changes, but um, we will, of course, update the school system anytime that we see changes from the province. Um, and then, of course, if there's any questions that emerge, um, we'll be checking in on those and answering those. 
So I'm not seeing uh, too many questions, but welcome to everyone. I, I see we have a number of people watching, which is great. And I'm gonna start by highlighting our major communication channels. So if you're like me, you may have been getting some messages in your inbox from HWDSB, and you may have just skipped past them and ignored them because you're not ready to think about back to school. But I hit today and I started going back and looking for those messages. Um, for back to school information, there is a lot of information on our website. And so the best thing you can do is go to hwdsb.on.ca or just Google us and click on the website. Um, and there's a get ready for school or for fall banner and you can just click on the learn more button and that's going to take you to a number of important links whether you're a new student to the system you're a returning student if you're in remote learning there's some information there about possible transitions so that's a, a great spot to hear to to find some um, important information now if you aren't receiving any emails from your school or the board i do want to remind you that you can actually subscribe to your school website for any updates that's posted on the website any communication from the principal and it's a really great idea that's an important communication tool we have to do that you can google your school name and go to the website or on our website we do have under schools you can find a list of elementary or a list of secondary schools it'll take you to your school website and if you just scroll down you'll see a white band that has subscribe in it there's a little icon when you click there you're going to provide your email and that just allows us to to send out those messages from your school community when they're populated on the website you can also turn on, and I think it's automatically turned on, receive updates from HWDSB. And yes, you'll probably get some duplication when that happens, but I, I highly recommend it because we have multiple ways to get information to you, and if it gets to your inbox, you're more likely to see it. Okay, that's uh, checking in for school communications. There's something else that I hadn't logged into for quite a while and I got asked, uh, Mom, I need to see my schedule. It's on the parent portal. Now, <laughs> that's for a high school student, but I've also seen a lot of parents and parent groups asking, how do I find out my child's class or teacher? And again, parent portal keeps coming up. So if you haven't logged in in a while, you, if you're lucky like me, your computer will remember your username and your login. Uh, if you're having trouble with that and you're like me and you don't track your passwords very well, you can contact your school and the school office can help you reset and get access to the parent portal. Or if you're a new parent and you haven't accessed it before, uh, the link is available through our website, but you get, again can contact your school if you're having trouble accessing it. Um, I will note that the parent portal is an important place to get into because it's where you have all the, those digital forms that you typically have to fill out at the beginning of the school year. So permission for class trips, something um, the, the form for nutrition breaks if your child's going home for one of the lunch breaks. Um, so it, it is an important spot to look into and there's some additional information in there. Um, there's a link to HWSTS, which is our transportation consortium. So if you are a student that uh, is going to be busing to school that will take you to their website through the parent portal uh, I do want to remind people there is an app version of power school and parent portal but we want you to use the web version so right now there there are some issues there may not be full updates for the app version so please just go to PS and I'm gonna ask um, my, my team here to put that in the chat ps.hwdsb.on.ca forward slash public forward slash home dot html and that was a bit of a, a long link so we'll, we'll put that in the chat okay the other thing you can do always is do a quick search for parent portal on the hwdsb website and you can click into links that way okay so i'm going to just check in uh, i don't see any questions so far so i am really honored and privileged to welcome our new director of education cheryl Robinson Petrazzini, and she's going to talk a bit about learning recovery and our plans to support our students. And I've got some cheering in the background that, that's silent cheering. <laughs> Welcome, Cheryl. Good evening. Good evening. So uh, I thought it would be great if you wanted to say hello to those of uh, those members of our community who joined us tonight, um, but also just talk about that commitment that we have to our students to make sure that we're helping them recover 
the learning loss that we know has happened over the past couple of years, uh, we know that supporting them is going to be really important. So, you know, yeah. if you, you want to take it away. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and thanks for uh, inviting me to be here this evening and for this opportunity. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to welcome your children back to school. We are really looking forward to this 2022-2023 uh, school year. And I know that you mentioned a few times that we are all anxious to get back to normal. And we know that it's not necessarily going to look like it did pre-pandemic because a lot has happened and we've learned a lot through this. But we are looking to really ensure that students have a welcoming environment, a safe and caring environment, and that we're paying attention to their mental health and well-being while supporting and promoting uh, ongoing learning. And so that's really going to be the focus. And um, yesterday I had the pleasure, as you know, um, of meeting with a lot of the leaders in our system. So principals, vice principals, managers, and you know, one of the things that we talked about is really allowing everyone to show up as their full and authentic selves. And, and I think that's a really important message for us at HWDSB because we know that the pandemic has affected students and families in different ways. And so part of our commitment is to ensure that we are supporting students um, individually in the way that they need to be supported. And that, um, you know, as I said, we're doing both. We're focusing on the learning because we know that some students would have had significant loss or gaps. And so we need to understand where our students are and we, we're going to invest the time to find out where they are, where are the gaps and how can we support them. So that might look different for your children. You, they might look different depending on their needs. Um, as a parent myself, you know, my children had very different experiences throughout this pandemic. One actually enjoyed working online a lot while the other one did not. So uh, just being mindful and educators really are committed to that, uh, to being mindful about where students are and how they can support them to, to go on. So. Yeah, that's just a little Thank intro. You. <laughs> now we do have um, just two questions. The first one, maybe we can just talk about how our education workers and our educators support students and their unique needs. So, um, you know, the fact is we are in a bargaining year and, and our different union groups are undergoing collective bargaining. They're doing that centrally with the province right now. So mm -hmm. um, I will say for back to school, we're really not we're not going to have any disruptions, mm -hmm. but of course there is always the pen potential of work action. Um, there is the potential for a strike. We're hoping that um, our very valued workers can get a fair mm -hmm. deal and that there's collaboration that's going to happen through this bargaining. Mm -hmm. But in the event that there is some kind of work action that could disrupt um, the classroom setting and the school setting, um, the question is, would teachers make sure there's like lessons available to students so they can keep working or work ahead um, on their schoolwork? So to answer that question directly, that would be something that would be a little bit difficult to, to just you know answer that question because we do respect collective bargaining and we do respect the processes and I think we have to wait to see where we were in that process. As you said uh, so very uh, aptly, it's, you know, we're hopeful of a quick resolution and a fair resolution for everyone. Uh, but at the same time, the work that teachers do in classrooms, uh, generally speaking, you know, anything that's done outside of those um, classroom hours, we know has always been volunteer. A voluntary and we're so grateful of the experiences that teachers offer but in terms of delivering the curriculum and classroom instruction that is a commitment that teachers would carry on um, you know whether or not there were a strike um, that work would continue so that core work of teaching our students supporting them looking at learning loss and how to address those gaps that's something that would continue and I know that um, there might be different opportunities uh, you know, for for teachers to share work, but I wouldn't want to preempt mm -hmm. discussions and, and, and yeah. Things. And I yeah. thank you for that yeah. um, because you know the teachers have their professional judgment; exactly. um, they know their classroom best. Exactly. But I, I can say, as a parent, um, when my children 
did need some extra work to do, um, you know, there's always that opportunity to, to have that discussion with the teacher. Um, and teachers often have like, oh, if, if you've done this work and you're, you're doing well, you can take it a step further and they often do offer resources. Mm -hmm. um, so it wouldn't be necessarily that lessons will be provided exactly. if, if our teachers go on strike. Right now I know the, the bargaining group is QP that's um, we're mm -hmm. hearing about in the paper. Because mm -hmm. um, if teachers go on strike, they won't be in the classroom. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm very hopeful that uh, the parties can come together mm -hmm. and we can get a fair deal and we can minimize any disruption for our students. Mm -hmm. But uh, we certainly don't expect any for the, the initial parts of the school year. Yeah. Uh, there was a question, and this one I guess I can answer. Will the new HWDSB app be replacing school messenger? So. Um, not at this time. <laughs> there, in time, we, we would hope that School Messenger and the app could, could be one system, but right now there, there are separate Mac, uh, apps for School Messenger and uh, for the HWDSB app, so thanks for that. And I just looked in the parent portal and didn't see new forms for this year either and I was I was actually as a parent like if I was looking for information <laughs> where would I find it and I found my login um, mm -hmm. so the port the forms will be updated shortly um, in fact if I could just check with associate director Dunlop um, the one form that didn't show up for me but my children are in secondary was the transition from remote to in person and that would be for for elementary students and actually maybe I'll just mention that now um, because we've shared a communication that the remote learning registration form will be available from this past Monday until September 7th and parents can use that form if you're registered for in-person and you would like to be in remote as of our, our uh, reorganization day which is in October. What's that? Both ways. Yeah, and, and, uh, sorry, <laughs> someone's saying, it's both ways. So if you're a person and want to go remote, or if you had registered back in June for remote and you would like to change to in person, this is your opportunity to do that. The change wouldn't happen until October. It is a commitment for the school year. Mm -hmm. But I just want to check, is that form uh, active in the parent portal? Okay, so I wouldn't see that because for secondary students, it's e-learning courses. It's not a separate remote school. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So those are the questions. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much thank for uh, joining us to talk about learning recovery and uh, saying hello to our system. Thank you. And uh, next, I'm going to invite up, thanks so much. I'm very excited for the year ahead, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> next, I'm gonna invite up Vice Chair Buck just to talk about um, you know, some of those, those tips and tricks for setting up positive, uh, a positive transition to the new school year. So welcome. Yeah, well, thank you for having me today, Chair Danko. Um, yeah, so moms and dads and caregivers know that next week is gonna be a rocky start. It's gonna be a rocky start at my house. I know that. And going into each school year, I try and think ahead, especially this week, what can I be doing now to help prepare? So having those conversations um, with, with your children, um, is a great place to start. They might have some very big emotions. Um, maybe they're positive. They're really looking forward to meeting their teachers, seeing friends that they haven't seen uh, in a couple of months possibly. Um, but they might also be feeling anxious. So how do we support them in that? And if you head to hwdsb.owen.ca, we have so many resources to help um, navigate that. But there are practical steps that you can be doing. Maybe it's uh, logging onto the parent portal, finding out your school's start times, logging on to HWSTS, that's our transportation, uh, finding out if, you're, if you qualify for, for transportation, uh, when do you need to try to be there for the bus, uh, remembering that things don't always go smoothly those first few weeks, so uh, showing up a, a few minutes early is always highly encouraged, just as we're finding our rhythm as a system and, and uh, transportation is part of that. Um, and uh, on, um, uh, you'll find your bell times on the website, you'll, you'll know where to gather. That's school specific information. So heading to your school's website is important for those kind of details. Um, kindergarten schedules um, and more, all of that you'll find um, at your school's individual website. Um, and uh, Chair Danko did mention those uh, system-wide communications as well. So um, as you're getting ready, preparing for next week, consider setting up a routine that best prepares your child. You know your child the best. 
what's going to work for them. Uh, giving them extra time in the morning, maybe that's the way, maybe they do need that extra 10 minutes of sleep so they're not grumpy guesses. Uh, and um, uh, starting off with a nutritious meal, we all know that breakfast is the most important, so uh, making sure that breakfast is, is uh, taken care of and exercise. Exercise gets us going in the morning. Um, maybe this is the year your family tries um, walking to school, taking a uh, bicycle, um, scooter, I don't know, get creative, have fun with it. Uh, if that's not always an option and you need to drive your child in, maybe this is the year where you park a couple blocks away and you walk your child uh, to the school. That Those last few meters is really not that far when you think about it. And it also helps with congestion around schools because we know that gets so busy and uh, we need to be very careful about safety, um, especially in our school zones. So um, yeah, that's some tips. Well, thank you for the, the tips, but also the reminder that we really, really want you to focus on safety. Um, so for a drop off and pick up time, we know that, that sometimes we, we see people that are anxious to get to work and they have to do the drop off and it seems like the closest location to the school is the best place to stop, but that often isn't a safe place to stop. So please make sure that you're observing all of the signs. We have no stopping signs for a reason to keep some areas clear um, so that our pedestrians are safe and our students have safe, safe walking paths. Um, but as Vice Chair Buck said, getting exercise and a nutritious meal at the beginning of the day, that actually primes the brain for learning. It, it actually sets the conditions for learning, for good social interactions, for well-being for your child. So if you can give them their best start to the day, that could be leaving a little bit early and parking and walking a, a couple of blocks even. Um, that small thing can make a difference. It also gives you time with your child to talk about what they're excited about for the day. And at the end of the day, if you can park and walk a few blocks, the walk home is that great time to check in and see what did you love about today? Um, and hopefully you'll have some great positive stories uh, the first few days next week. Mm -hmm. Great, um, thank you so much Vice Chair Buck, I appreciate that. I'm just gonna check in and see if there's any questions. It's, it's often uh, seems like common sense uh, to start with like a routine this week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that I got a lot of pushback from one of my children in particular who said, well, school hasn't started. I should be able to stay up all night. <laughs> uh, but I know how important it was to start setting up the, that routine and structure uh, at least a week before. Mm -hmm. um, so a question that we might want to turn to someone else for, but if you're new to HWDSB, how do you register? So we do have information on our website. So again, hwdsb.on.ca. That should become one of your, your likes or your stars in your, in your um, Google mm -hmm. Finder. You could bookmark it. <laughs> what is that called? The bookmark. The bookmark, thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, so if you click on Learn More, where it says Getting Ready for September, um, there is an, a, a link for new students, and there's a link there where you can um, get information about how to register. Uh, so if you're returning to school and you're part of our system, there's no need to re-register, so just remember that. If you've been learning remotely previously but you didn't register for remote for this fall, you're, you're good, you're registered and you're returning to in-person. Um, but you can also, if you want to go directly to a link, hwdsb.on.ca forward slash, slash sorry, forward slash register um, will also take you to links and forms um, and you can contact your school. There is some additional information you have to provide besides a form for your school. Um, I believe it's proof of address and probably proof of like your birth certificate for your child. Um, so you will need to visit the school to do that. But um, if you have questions about which school uh, is your school, just reach out to us and we'll make sure that you get connected to the appropriate school. Thanks for that question. Okay, uh, so thank you, uh, Vice Chair Buck. I appreciate uh, sharing those tips and tricks. Next, I wanted to talk a bit about health measures for the start of the school year because uh, over the past two years, that's been one of the primary reasons we've even hosted these sessions. Like, what can you expect? What are you supposed to do? Where do you find information? And so. Again, we are so excited that we're welcoming people back this fall in person after two and a half years of disruptions due to COVID-19. Um, in fact, I'd love to not have to talk about that anymore, but the fact is it still is with us. 
We've asked you to do a lot, and we've asked staff to do a lot to try to maintain safe schools over the past uh, two and a half years. So most of the health and safety guidance from the province is largely unchanged in principle, but the details are a little bit different. So I want to bring a few things to your attention, and I just want to note that we are following provincial direction. Um, there was an announcement today and some updates today, so I've made a list of notes about if you have symptoms or you're exposed when you isolate, and that's just changed. So I'm going to make sure I just highlight um, what the new, the new outline is for that. In terms of screening, that was one of the important measures that we asked you to do um, because at the end of the day, if people stay home when they're not well, we can protect others. And, and that was one of the critical steps we can do. So although you don't have to show your screening at the school, you've done that a number of times over the past uh, two and a half years, you don't need to show it, but we're asking you to screen every day or screen your child every day. There is a screening tool and it highlights the key symptoms that are related to COVID-19. There's quite a few of them. Some are related to um, things that you might have because you, you get them anyways, like headaches, and that could be related to weather. So you're thinking about, is this a symptom? Is it new? Is it related to something that I normally have? Allergies, for example. If you're congested and it's your allergy season and you can take an allergy pill and that goes away, that wouldn't be a reason to stay home. But if you are congested and that's not normal for you, then that may be a reason to stay home, but check the screening tool. Um, Essentially, uh, it, if you have one or more of the symptoms that are listed, then you would be asked to stay home until your symptoms are resolving for at least 24 hours. And, you know, it's a little bit different for nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And that's always been, you need to have symptoms resolving for 48 hours before you come back to school. And it doesn't matter what the problem is, that's a time to stay home. Um, okay, so I do want to just highlight, let me find my notes because there were just changes. For isolation rules, we've gone through a number of different iterations of like isolation rules. Um, you know, if you were sick, does your family have to stay home or not? And I know that was a huge challenge for many of our families and for our staff. So the new updates that we just got today, if someone is sick and they can't participate in school, so they have one of the symptoms, um, in particular, if they have a fever, if they have diarrhea, they should be absolutely staying home. Um, use the screening tool. We're going to really encourage that. Again, you don't have to show proof of it, but it's an important tool that you can use. And now this is the, the update. Um, when someone is, f hang on one second. So if you have symptoms, you're isolating at home. If you are a family member of someone with symptoms or someone who's tested positive, you do not have to isolate at home. And that was a change because it used to depend on your vaccination status and your age, but you do not have to isolate at home. It is recommended that you wear a mask while you have someone in your household who is sick and following that, again, it's recommended, it's not mandatory. Um, now, I already talked about when to return to school. So again, if you, have, if you don't have a fever and your symptoms are resolving for 24 hours or 48 hours for gastrointestinal symptoms, then it's time to come back to school. Um, previously, we found that if you were tested positive, you would have to isolate and there would be a specific length of time. But now, as long as those symptoms are resolving for 24 or 48 hours, depending on the symptom, no fever, you can come back, even with a positive test. Uh, there are some stricter recommendations for people who are immunocompromised, uh, people living in high-risk congregate settings. Um, and so it's really important to make sure that you, you look at the Ontario website. I had that listed here. It's covid-19.ontario.ca. As of today, these recommendations aren't on there. The old ones are. So give them a day or two to update that. But that is an important place where you can see what's recommended for you and your family. Okay, any questions related to that? Okay, great. Um, so also related to COVID-19, I wanted to ask Associate Director Dunlop to, to join me. And just, uh, I have a couple questions that I'm sure families might have, if you haven't thought of them or posted them in, in the chat yet, it probably would happen in the next few weeks. So testing is one of the strategies that we've used and we've been able to provide rapid tests to students and staff at our schools and we did that through kits and then on request. So what is the status of rapid tests at our schools? So thanks for the question, Don. I'm actually thrilled to be here. I find back to school one of the most exciting times of the year. It's a fresh start and it's a great way to 
you know, set, set routines and set the tone as you've talked about. So thanks for inviting me on. Um, we are still providing not only rapid tests at schools, so parents and students just have to ask for them, or rather family and students, parents, caregivers, and uh, guardians. And also we're, we're able to f provide masks for any students who would like to wear them. Schools are a mask-friendly environment, so it is voluntary to wear a mask, but you are also welcome to wear a mask, and we can provide the masks for you. Oh, great, and that was actually going to be my follow-up question. Mm. And so we, we did see a shift in the spring, and I think that was a challenging shift where uh, we went from requiring masks, you had to have a mask ex exemption if you weren't going to wear one, to them being strongly recommended. So you, we're, we're mask-friendly. Are we, st are we still hearing that public health is recommending masks indoors or in what settings? So we are hearing that public health is recommending um, masks in public settings where physical distancing is not... Um, possible and so we certainly encourage people to wear masks if that's what they would like to do yes thank you and uh, the other question that tends to come up and students probably have this question especially in elementary uh, we've gone through different variations of cohorting over the past two years so are we cohorting this year so in terms of cohorting at recess and having to stay in your own separate little area as a cohort no we are not doing that so students will be happy to hear that they can mix and mingle on the playground and play with different classes. I know that uh, recess time and lunch time is a real, mm -hmm. it's, one of the, it's one of the students' key um, moments in the day. They really enjoy doing that, and so no, no more cohorting. Which is great. I live near a school, so I love the sounds of children in the, in the playground. And they, they really shifted when cohorting was, was stopped mm -hmm. in the spring, and you could just see the energy change. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that'll be very positive. We know that a lot of the restrictions that we put on our students, um, they were challenging and so now that we're at a point where the recommendations are that we don't have to do this, I think it's going to be important to support as mm -hmm. much normal uh, socializing activities as possible. Um, another thing that we did in the spring, uh, in winter and spring, was we, we monitored absence rates. So is that something that will continue into the fall? We are going to continue that in the fall. Um, as many parents know, and families know we if if someone self-reports a positive uh, COVID test, then we will uh, put that on the school website at the end of the day. Principals will do that, so you, so families are able to monitor any positive self-reported tests. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just want to note. I'm going to ask our our manager of facilities uh, to talk a little bit more about ventilation in a moment, but I'm going to sort of switch topics because we do have a question. Um, one of the things that happened last year, there were a number of lockdowns and we had a number of scares in, in June that were really unfortunate. Um, but sometimes the communication maybe wasn't getting to parents in a way that, that worked for them. Um, so the question is, can we get better communication when school is in a lockdown? So maybe you can share like what our priorities are there and, and how what strategies we take to communicate. Uh, sure, I'm happy to. So we do have a number of, safe, of secure schools protocols, um, and lockdown is one, but there are also other ones, um, shelter in place and um, hold and secure. So it really depends on where a threat might be. And a lockdown is only initiated on usually when the police initiate it. And in terms of communication, we do have communication standards. You can find those on the board website if parents and families would like to know a little bit more about that. And we try our best in terms of immediate and direct communication, Some, but we also work closely with the police if they're involved, and we are guided by them in terms of communication as well. So we understand, of course, that families uh, really want that communication, and we do our very best to make sure that it's timely. Okay, and flipping topics again, uh, we often do have a lot of questions from our kindergarten families because it's a really exciting time, but it might be your child's first time in the school, and maybe yours. Hopefully you got to do the orientation in, in June. They typically hold in the spring. Um, but parent, one, one person is asking, do parents have to be with students in the school during the kindergarten orientation on the first day? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's really exciting when your child first goes to school. There are so many unknowns. And you may remember things that happened when you were in kindergarten, which might be quite a long time ago. So I understand the question. Uh, when what we do is we have a bit of a staggered entry for kindergarten so the first day we only have half the students in there the students who are in year one and who have never attended so parents do not attend with them it is a regular school day for those year one students and then uh, the second day all the students come together so it's just a day for students to 
who haven't been in school before to get used to the school environment and get used to their educators in their classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, any tips for um, <laughs> for parents dropping off that child for the first yeah. time? It, it can be tough. Don't it hover. can be really don't, tough. Don't stay and hover. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes your your child may be upset. They may be crying, and you know that really wrenches at a parent's heart when their mm -hmm. child is upset. Um, and the educators there are so good and they can really advise the parents about the best thing to do. You know, should you leave right away? Um, should you hover? And so I would really take your, your cue from the educators. There's a teacher and a designated early childhood educator in every classroom because they are very experienced. They've been doing this a long time and they've seen lots of kids come to school for the first time. So they know what to do. Great, and yeah. I'm gonna ask you one more question mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll talk about facilities and, and, and wrap things up for this evening. Um, again, switching topics on you, but uh, our director talked about our, our focus on learning recovery and meeting the individual needs of each student, seeing where they are in their learning. Um, there's a question about tutoring support. So we, we were fortunate to get funding and, and provide different tutoring supports through the, the uh, spring and summer. What does, what does that look like and what's it going to look like into the fall? Great question. We are actually uh, just wrapping up our summer tutoring and uh, we really had amazing attendance and we're going to be reviewing not only how successful those different programs were, we had different sites, uh, we had lots of different kinds of programs happening and we also worked with community partners who provided uh, tutoring. So we're going to be reviewing some of those and preparing for what we're calling phase three of tutoring which is coming into the fall so there'll be lots more information about that but absolutely there will be tutoring again this fall so wait for the announcement should be coming soon okay so be patient but but we will we will share information as soon as we have it mm -hmm. thank you so much for oh, thank uh, you. doing the rapid fire yeah. questions it was fun thank <laughs> different you different topics uh so i'm next i'm going to just ask our senior manager of facilities to come join me for a moment um one of the the things that we spent a lot of time talking about and i learned a lot about ventilation last year yeah. uh, we had a lot of projects a lot of there was federal funding and provincial funding that really helped us upgrade ventilation in our schools mm -hmm. um what's been happening over the summer and uh you know if i can throw the hepa filter word out there <laughs> what are we doing with hepa filters uh, in our schools has there been any changes great question don and thanks for having me so uh, HEPAs, uh, we've, we've spent the majority of the summer uh, going through and making sure that those units are serviced. So by servicing them, we're cleaning them, we're vacuuming them, and changing the actual filter component itself. Some of the manufacturers recommend once or twice, um, depending on uh, once a year, or it could be every five years, we're doing all of them. So we now have just over 2,500 HEPA units in our schools. Uh, they'll be in the FDK spaces, portables, gymnasiums, uh, any areas that don't have the, the uh, tier one um, uh, HVAC uh, ventilation, mechanical ventilation, so as described by the ministry. So um, any of those spaces, uh, again, we'll have those HEPA units. They're ready to go. They're in place now and, um, and the schools are ready. Uh, it's been a busy summer as it is every summer for us, but uh, the COVID uh, resilience infrastructure funding projects have been wrapping up. Uh, so people will see schools that are uh, improved ventilation. Uh, we've added cooling in some of these schools as well where we could with the uh, existing infrastructure. So things are in place and we're ready to go. Great. And, uh, you know, a question always comes up. It's Wednesday, the week before school starts, and there's still stuff happening in the, in the schoolyard or in the school and people are seeing work going on. Uh, what can they expect in terms of that wrapping up over the next week? Great question. So we're right down to the wire every year. It doesn't matter uh, how much we plan or how much we uh, allocate resources. Uh, the temporary Sherwood site, for example, was one that was down to the wire. We had students touring that facility today uh, and uh, great feedback so far, but it was down to the wire, making sure that we had everything in place. But uh, we're working hard and uh, our, our folks are busy. Well, thank you so much for, for providing that update. and. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll make sure we bring you back if we do one of these again this Absolutely. year. And you can tell us about the, the new projects that are going on throughout the year. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Okay, and so just any final questions? Um, let me just see if I've missed anything. Talked about that. Okay. Uh, oh, 
just a, a couple of last questions and then I'll wrap things up. So when will we receive a start date for JK students? So that's what Associate Director Dunlop was talking about. Um, for kindergarten students, uh, there's a different schedule for JK and SK students. And so they bring in new students on the first day of school typically and then the whole class on the second day of school. And it just helps our new students uh, get used to the space and transition with less people in the room. So your school will communicate specifically with you um, what the schedule is for your child if you're in kindergarten. So if you're JK or SK, please watch for that. If you can't find that information uh, by the end of this week, um, I would say just reach out to the school office, maybe midday on Friday, um, because you want to be prepared for, for Tuesday. But you should see communication coming out this week from your school. Um, another question was about children who maybe don't have all of the vaccinations and vaccination eligibility for COVID-19 uh, has been shifting. So there's boosters available to different age groups now. I think uh, there was an update today, a booster is now going to be available in September for, for students or children who are five to 12. Um, they've extended the eligibility for an initial vaccination, I think from six months and up. So I want to remind everyone, um, you may have had a, a summer where you could be away from, from crowded spaces and it's not really something that's been front of mind, but there are vaccination clinics that um, Hamilton Public Health is going to be running. You can look at the city website, cityofhamilton.ca, I believe. Um, Maybe, maybe someone on the team can look that up for me and post it in the chat. Uh, but they're going to be running some clinics, I believe, out of Lime Ridge Mall um, leading up to the start of school. So if your child is eligible for a shot or a booster, um, this is a great time to get it. Um, so, so certainly there's no mandatory requirement for vaccinations for COVID-19, but uh, they are recommended. And um, if you're not sure, make sure you talk to your health care provider to find out what's right for your child and your family. Um, just seeing, we've got uh, a question about bus stops. So uh, bus stops can be allocated different distances from someone's home depending on the type of pickup. So if you're in a French immersion program, we use something called group stops. And so those tend to be further from home. Um, transportation for French immersion is something that we're not specifically funded for and it is quite expensive because we have students coming from broader catchment areas to a school. Um, so it's one of the ways that we, we try to provide transportation but it is a limitation. Um, if you have a concern about your bus stop and you, you feel that it's uh, you know, significantly uh, distant from your home or it's not a safe spot, through HWSTS, and you can find, that's the, the consortium, the transportation consortium, uh, you can find a link to that in the parent portal, as I mentioned, on our website. That's where you can identify that there may be an issue with a bus stop and they will review the, the stop for you. Uh, quick question about an, uh, another opportunity to tr transition from in-class to remote. So your opportunity to make a decision for the school year is now. Um, as I mentioned, there's a form in Parent Portal, and if you're changing your choice, so you're automatically registered in person if you did nothing in the spring and you didn't register for remote. Um, but if you're registered for remote and you want to shift to in-person right now, if you're registered for in-person and you want to register for remote right now, you have until September 7th to make a decision about that. And then um, that change will happen when we have our natural reorganization usually in early October and that's when sometimes children do have to shift classrooms I know that's always a challenge um, but that will be a commitment for the entire year we always look at people that may have exceptional circumstances so if something changes for your family um, please reach out through your school and it may be to the superintendent and they'll look at your particular situation but uh, we do need to have our staffing established for the school year and is it possible to attend orientation in the spring? Sorry, I'm not they sure I... They miss orientation in the spring. Say that again? They miss orientation in the spring. Can they come to an orientation now? For, Sorry. For JK. Oh, for JK. They missed it in the spring. Oh, if someone missed orientation, I'm so sorry, I was trying to understand the question. Uh, if someone missed orientation for JK in the spring, could they do that now? Um, we're not really set up to, to do school visits this week, and I know our administrators are working hard to make sure they're, they're getting last minute registrations or newcomers into the neighborhood registered for the school, um, getting everything set up. So 
certainly you can contact your school to see if um, you know a quick walkthrough is possible and, and I'm sure that uh, something short and, and brief could be possible. Uh, even just doing a walk around the school and the neighborhood with your child can be a great way to just get them accustomed with this building that they're going to be going to and get them excited about it. Um, but reach out to your school to see what might be possible this week and uh, certainly that, that first day is a day where students are really highly supported uh, when they're new to our schools as well. So uh, I think we're going to stay online to keep answering questions in the chat, but I am going to wrap up. Um, quick important question, I have to make sure I answer this. If you cannot get into the parent portal, please contact your school. Do it tomorrow. <laughs> Call the office at your school. If you're not sure of the number, look up your school's name. You can do that on our website or just Google it and you should be able to find your school um, pretty easily online. Give them a call and they will get you set up to access Parent Portal. Uh, I know that we had challenges last year and it can be really frustrating when you're looking for that information. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I'm not sure how many people we ended up having uh, come in, but I really appreciate the questions. I appreciate the opportunity to just go over some of this uh, core information that hopefully will help you transition your, your children back to school next week. As we all mentioned, we are so excited to welcome all of our students and staff back and we have our fingers crossed for a great school year ahead. So thanks so much everyone, have a great evening.